Hi everyone. So today we're going to talk about transformations in the data science cycle uh, with our breast cancer data set. But first I want to introduce you to a concept called Simpson's Paradox. Okay, so how do I explain this? Um, suppose we asked a, a group of individuals um, how satisfied they are with the car they purchased. Okay, so on this axis, uh, it's increased number of dollars, uh, how much they paid for their car. I missed a dollar sign here, making this work of modern art. Okay. So, uh, for example, here, um, this this person here paid two and a half dollars for their uh, car. And along the y-axis is our measure of satisfaction, ranging from not happy at all to quite happy. Okay, so um, when we're not aware uh, that the points sample or people or objects, whatever the case might be, belong to two distinct groups, let's say poor versus rich, then um, in this plot here, all the points are colored black. And if we were to look at this, I would say it looks like there's a trend that, that, that rises as somebody spends more. I mean, this person here who spent about one and a half dollars on their car is not very happy. Um, but this person over here who spent almost three dollars on their car uh, is you know seemingly very happy with their with their purchase okay however if we're told actually that um, these points down here are all poor people or low income let's say and the red points are all high income people okay and we read the the, tr the trend we look at the trend now within those two groups. So just within the blue group, we would probably conclude that there's a downward trend. So this person here paid very little, but they uh, ended up um, quite happy. Whereas those that paid more relative within their own social economic range uh, are quite unhappy. And the same is true with the high income individuals. So um, trend goes upwards more happy, more dollars, trends going down, the more they pay, the less happy they become. Okay, so um, Simpson's paradox says that the phenomena where a trend appears in several different groups, this downward trend, um, can disappear or even reverse like it does here when the groups are combined, they're all just black points, okay? so. How would you interpret these plots? Um, if you were just to look at this, what would your interpretation be? And how would you write that up in a scientific manuscript? And if you were then to see the same plot, I mean, I, I wanna stress that these are the same points. It's just that they're, now we can do it within the two groups. How does that change your interpretation? Um, how do you then, you know, what, what kind of arguments would you give for this kind of uh, downward trend versus this upward trend? And, and your real challenge is not is today is to figure out how Simpson's paradox relates to the subject matter of today's lecture. Okay. So um, we're going to look at uh, the transform uh, in, in this cycle today, uh, and we're going to re return to the TCGA data set. So transformations allow us to select specific subsets of the data for visualization and modeling. Okay. And that's what we're going to give you the tools to do today. But before we start with the technical aspects there, let's stop and ask, you know, why do we want to do data science on breast cancer to transcriptomes to begin with, or for any other data set for that matter? And, you know, basically I'm asking you to step back and say, imagine you had a data set in front of you. What are your goals from that data set? Why did you generate it in the first place? Um, what motivated it, right? And I'll give a link here and you can check it on your own time, but this is to a kind of a famous old protest song from the Vietnam War. Okay, now data science is certainly not warfare, but um, I can attest that uh, projects that are not well designed, that are not um, uh, carefully executed in in the um, when you're profiling your tumors or whatever the subject is, they can quickly turn into a quagmire that might take years for a PhD student to um, recuperate from. They'll be lost in analysis if they don't have a clear idea of where they're going. Now, okay, it's important to go in with clear questions. 
okay, of what you want from that data set. We're going to talk about those in a little bit. But I'm, I'm not suggesting that in data science and in research and in industrial settings, companies, etc. Um, is that you need to be as precise as a clinical trial. In clinical trials, I think that most people know what they are. So for example, a pharmaceutical wants to market a drug, take a drug to market because they believe it cures cancer. Well, they're carried out by the government in collaboration with Health Canada or the NIH. And there's a million issues there about how the design of that experiment to, to ensure that it's asking the right question, that everything is measurable, that success and failure are well-defined, that it's objective, that it's powered. So statistical power means that you have enough patients to um, address variability, uh, dropout, all sorts of issues that come up. Dropout means when patients uh, that are part of a trial no longer participate. Uh, th th those those kinds of clinical trials are incredibly precise. They're they're almost like legal documents. We're not expecting that in data science. It's a bit more forgiving, but it's still important to have concepts of what the endpoint of a study is. Every area is different, but let's use cancer informatics as our example here. Why are we doing this? Okay, better science. So we want to understand what's going on in that tumor, right? If we can pin down the genes and gene products that are involved in its progression or invasion, um, then we can maybe target those uh, proteins or pathways, those processes, and they may have ther therapeutic potential, right? Um, so ways to discover uh, clinical interventions. Okay, so um, what is a clinical endpoint? And th this is the formal definition. Clinical endpoints are distinct measurements or analyses of disease characteristics observed in a research study or clinical trial that reflect the effect of a therapeutic intervention. Um, in other words, you need to precisely define um, what success is. So in a drug trial, um, the distinct measurements might be, for example, size of the tumor, okay? Uh, so if the size of the tumor is no longer increasing, that might indicate success in, in a research study, okay? It suggests that give whatever drug is being used there is ablating growth of the tumor. There's a lot of examples of different kinds of uh, endpoints. Um, goals for the project. For example, um, we might be interested in finding a gene that um, when mutated indicates that a woman is uh, at risk of developing breast cancer. It doesn't mean that she has breast cancer, nor does it definitively mean that she'll get breast cancer. It just indicates that she a, has a higher risk than the background population of developing breast cancer in her lifetime. Um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are examples uh, in breast cancer that uh, affect about 3 to 5% of women. Screening, um, mammography, I think most people know a little bit about that. So in the population of healthy women, perhaps the elderly um, or those uh, at elevated risk, uh, let's say harboring mutations of BRCA1 from the previous example, they would be subjected to regular mammography and uh, that screening is then um, a noisy uh, indicator that she may have breast cancer. It's by no means definitive that she has breast cancer. And that's where the controversy that swirls around mammography comes from is that there's a lot of high, uh, false positives. Diagnosis. So once we think the woman might have breast cancer, say from screening, how do you accurately confirm that she does? Is there a gene or gene product, a protein that we can measure that would make um, a pregnancy test relatively or with high, high probability um, decide that she does have the disease or not? Classification, we talked already about this a little bit, you know, that breast cancer has different subtypes. And so we need markers that identify the type of a, um, uh, the, type, the subtype of breast cancer that a woman has given that she's been diagnosed with the disease. Prognosis, benefit from therapy, th these come up when um, in clinical settings where a woman comes in and she's diagnosed with the disease, okay, and 
they take a biopsy, for example, and we look at the molecular portrait of those tumors and we ask, you know, can we predict which drugs that woman would respond to or not? And, and in fact, there's actually a, um, a beautiful bioinformatics genomics that's uh, object out there called Oncotype DX. It's now standard practice in most of the Western world, version of it is. And it, it decides in estrogen receptor positive women uh, whether they'll benefit from chemotherapy or not. And there's tremendous social and economic benefit from that. Social because um, chemotherapy is not nice at all. And if a woman can avoid this uh, that treatment, that's great. Um, and economic because chemotherapy actually costs a lot of money and not just for the drug, but the impact on the family and on the hospital system. Money saved in one spot can go towards uh, saving lives somewhere else. Okay. Well, regardless of what your endpoint is in the project, um, there's concept of clinical utility and validity that are you know, very important. And again, um, we're not doing clinical trials in research settings, but we still have to see where this is going. Um, it's preclinical, right? Most of the stuff we're doing, we're trying to uh, find evidence that genes or gene products um, are good diagnostics in different ways, right? Good markers for different endpoints. And, but you still need to have a, set, a sense of, uh, in my opinion, you need to have a sense of where it's, how it's gonna be used. Um, so how is that marker going to um, uh, change how a clinician treats a woman? How will it uh, decide, um, help the clinician decide which drug to give or not give? Uh, or what general strategy to take. It's not always about drugs. And clinical validity means that, you know, is that you have to realize uh, and, uh, that your cohort is small. It's a research setting. It may have biases and um, limitations. It doesn't necessarily ref ref reflect the population as a whole. And so, you know, when you learn something in a lab, you need to then see if it generalizes to real clinical settings. And in fact, that, you, that you, you know, you can accurately measure, you know, and, and what you want in a clinical setting and not just in, in your lab, in the comfort of your lab. Okay, so the bottom line here is that, you know, in every study, we're, we're in an incredibly difficult situation because Biological systems are very noisy. Populations are very diverse and heterogeneous. And we have, you know, why? Because we have things like technical noise due to inaccurate measurements and biases, you know, due to the level of humidity in the air, et cetera. All of these things change our day-to-day our -day measurements. Biological noise, meaning, you know, our cells go through um, cycles, like the cell cycle. Um, individuals have their, their cycles. Um, sleep cycles, all sorts of things. Women have menstrual cycles. That means that cells um, at the time of harvesting are, can, can change, uh, can be very different from one to the next. So one part of day science in, in, in biology is to, uh, I find useful, is to search for um, a core homogenous subgroup. Uh, if we look at our TCGA data set, we're gonna see there's a lot of heterogeneity across many of the of the measured variables. And maybe that's not the right place to look for a signal. If you're trying to find a gene for um, uh, benefit from the therapy, then maybe the proper thing, the better thing to do is start with a very core group of pretty homogenous individuals, see if it works there, and then sort of build yourself out like an onion. Okay, so um, to get that core group, you need the tools to um, manipulate your cohort. So we're gonna look at dplyr today. It's part of the tidyverse. Uh, okay, so if G, ggplot is, is the grammar of grass, dplyr is this beautiful package for um, uh, data transformation. Okay, so like before, as you now know um, pretty well, I think, is you need to start by loading your, your tidyverse. That's gonna give you access to dplyr because it's part of that. And then you're going to uh, load um, the TCGA uh, data set. 
uh, I can't do it here in the slide setting, but if you do view of uh, small BRCA, the data set, you get a nice spreadsheet view of the data for you to explore. Okay, so here's a little piece of it. It's a tibble. I talked a little bit before about that. Um, and it has uh, 1,200 observations. Okay, so 1,200 patients essentially are samples. And for each such sample, 79 different variables are recorded. Okay, so it's a relatively large data set. And I, I remind you again that this is a miniaturization of the true TCGA data set. The number of variables is actually uh, much larger. It's uh, on the order of about 25,000. Okay, so um, what I want to point out here is that uh, um, that each variable, column, ID, participant, uh, etc., and then some are there's many more here that are not um, printed out for space reasons. And that includes, for example, the number of days since birth of the person, their gender, okay, um, their menopausal status their race, ethnicity, uh, the status of their tumor, okay, so present or not, vital status, live or dead, death, uh, the number of days, uh, if they died, the number of days they survived post-diagnosis, okay, uh, so the clock starts ticking at the time of diagnosis, and, and many other variables that we're going to look at a little bit today uh, in the future, and in the future. These last 50 variables are all different genes uh, where we've measured gene expression using RNA-seq from aniline uh, to TM, TMEM45B. And inside of this set are some pretty famous players like our ESR1 here. And uh, let's see here, where's ERB2? Just to remind you again that ERB2 is the official name for HER2. Okay. Now, there are actually one other aspect here I want to explain is that there's this row below the the name of the variables uh, and it's in these angle brackets and here it's CHR and that's short for character. Okay, so ID is a, we say it's a, it's a variable of type uh, character. Okay, it's, you can think of uh, characters as being essentially natural language. And all of the examples here, in fact, are characters, but other variables don't have character as their, we'll call it type, okay? So, um, for example, if we scroll down a little ways, we can see that the gene expression measurements down here from aniline all the way down to the last guy, they're all DBL, and that's short for double. And double is old fashioned computer speak for a real number because the counts are real numbers, okay? You'll see here under tumor, we have LGL, and that's short for logical. And tumor is what we call a Boolean vari variable. It can either take true or false. In fact, there's other types of, uh, type, there's other types um, of data that's not represented here. And we're gonna see one called a factor uh, later on. That's very important. Okay, so dplyr, I, I don't know if you've discovered these by now, but our studio has these cheats, cheat sheets for different packages, and I, I definitely, I highly recommend them. Um, uh, you can print them out or just have them uh, around, and it's, uh, after a while, you just turn to this and you can figure out what you need. It gives you kind of an overview and of how things work, and it's two pages long. Okay, they're available from the R Studio website. Okay, so uh, let's start with some filtering of observations. So again, remember that variables are columns in our data, right? So in a tibble, uh, in a tibble, you have uh, your variables here and um, your rows are your observations. So your samples are patients, right? Okay, so this was about 1200 observations by 79 variables. Okay, so we don't want all those observations, nor do we necessarily want, uh, um, okay, so we're gonna focus first on observations. We might not want all of them. Maybe we wanna get rid of some. Okay, we wanna get rid of these guys because they're a little bit 
They're not part of that homogeneous core I was talking about. So how do we get rid of rows observations? And that's the filter function. Okay, so um, let's start by removing um, the morphologically normal samples from the analysis. If you recall from last class, uh, we plotted ESR1 expression versus ERB2 expression as a scatter plot, and we colored uh, the blue points true to be if the tumor, if it's a tumor, false if it's not a tumor. And we saw that the um, these guys down here were the, the morphologically normal samples. They're matched samples from the same individual. This is how we're going to remove normal samples using the filter function. My filter function is right here. And you can see that uh, it takes two parameters, my original tibble, small bracket, and a second thing, which is a Boolean or logical function. Now, um, the basic idea here is that the filter recognizes that this is the tibble that we're to operate upon. And any sample that has um, the tumor status of being true is, is kept, it's retained. If tumor is equal to false, so if, if this condition evaluates the false, then that sample is removed. And so a filter will go through every row one by one, and it'll check the status of tumor. If it's true, it's kept. Okay. And then, uh, recall from last class, this means assigns two, and I'll create a new tibble called tumor bracket, which is basically the sub-tibble of small bracket with those normal samples removed. And that's why I've chosen the term tumor. But that's, of course, arbitrary. Now, one last thing here that has nothing to do with filter, but it's a nice tip for our is programming, is that um, I put these parentheses around my expression. Now, those parentheses have no effect on the, on the expression itself. But what they do is they print out the results to the screen. So if I was to execute the same expression of tumor brachas assigned to blah, 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 without those parentheses, it would happen. I would be happy to add that new variable to the environment, but you wouldn't see the result here on the screen. So it's just a way of, it's just a, it's a nice little way of uh, helping you explore data. Okay. And uh, lastly here, you can see that um, now I have some 1,100 rows. And of course, my the number of variables, columns, is unchanged. But if I were to go back here to, I don't want to make you dizzy, but if we go back here a couple slides, uh, we can see that the original um, data set had over 1,200 samples. So we've gotten um, rid of about 200 rows to corresponding to these morphologically normal samples. Okay. So that's your first D plier. And we can make sure it worked by just repeating that GG plot. But this time here, uh, I can see that there's no tumor equal to false left anymore. And they're all the same color. Note that R switched the coloring, but that's arbitrary. I mean, this is the legend, and, and so it did in fact work. Okay, so um, let's take a look at a little bit more of a complicated uh, scenario, and this is a very common event uh, that happens in biological data sets. So um, when I um, I wrangled the data from TCGA into a tibble, uh, so we're going to come across this. Uh, term wrangle a lot. That's really essentially part two of this course. Um, that's taking the data from some website or resource database and getting it into a tibble. And it's really hard actually, and you'll see why later on. But, but the thing is, is that when I do that, I, I'm just downloading what other people call the, their variables and their observations and all sorts of things. And, and sometimes it's a bit hard to understand. Like when I look at all of, uh, I look at tumor bracket, which is the data set I just created by filtering out normals. Okay, so here I use the dollar sign. And I don't know if you've seen that yet. And what that does is it gives me access to the, the columns, the variables. And one of my columns or variables was called AGCC pathological tumor stage. That's this TNM stage. I'll show you just uh, I don't want to make you dizzy, but you'll see if you fly through here, you'll see it there. It's one of my variables. So if I want to access just that variable instead of the whole tibble, 
I can use the dollar sign. Okay, so here I'm saying, give me all the values for the tumor uh, data set um, in, with stage. And the other function I use here is unique. Now, of course, there's 1,000 some rows, right? Every sample in our data set has a tumor stage. But what I'm interested in is not the list of all 1,000 tumor stages. I just want to know the different ones that are there, the distinct set of names within tumor stage. We call them distinct values. So here, when I do the unique on the result of that, what I get is this here, which just goes from stage 1 to stage 1A. And then I get some weird things like stage 5. That's OK. But discrepancy, stage X. I don't know what stage X is. NA, uh, which we talked about last class, means not available. That kind of makes sense. They didn't have the stage information for it. But then sometimes it's been labeled as the English not available. Now notice here there's quotes. So what is the class of all of these objects? I'll leave that to you to think about. But the hint here is that this class, this is an A. It's slightly different. It's not a character, right? It's just not available. Um, OK, so I don't know what to do about some of these things. Um, so maybe what I should do is uh, remove uh, some of these strange or missing um, observations, some of the rows. So um, for example, I'm not sure that I want 9, 12, 13, or 14. 9, that's discrepancy, not available, or this. And I don't think I want stage X. Uh, I'm not really sure what it is. And well, it doesn't seem very homogenous with the rest. So maybe that's not a good thing. So I should do some data cleaning here. How do I do that? OK, so the filter function, here's another example. And now we're going to bring in some of the logic we saw um, last class. and OK, so let's go through here. Here's my filter function. OK, and what am I filtering on? I'm filtering on my tumor bracket data set. OK, now here, this is going to, I'm going to come back and I'm going to go through this stepwise so you guys don't freak out. But that's my expression for what observations I want to keep in the study. But before I do that, just to say whatever this whole function gets back, it's going to be all the observations that pass this test. They're going to be assigned equal to a new variable, a tibble, a variable with type um, tibble called TNM for tumor uh, for the stage um, tumor bracket. So from tumor bracket to TNM tumor bracket. It's an arbitrary name. OK, so now the question is, what is this condition here? Because it looks really crazy. So recall that this is the not. That's the not operator. And so I'm going to keep every observation that's not whatever is between this parenthesis and this parenthesis. This parenthesis here, oops, nope, I'm sorry, between this parenthesis and this parenthesis. Anything that's not those guys, I'm going to keep. So who do I want to get rid of? Well, I have this function here, is na, which we saw a little bit at the last class. Notice that it's saying, is na. Now, it knows that it looks at the tumor bracket file and says, I look at the stage. And if it's na, I don't want it, right? Because that was number 14 over here. We wanted to get rid of those guys, right? That takes care of that. Or so I want to get rid of these guys. If, if, this, if this condition passes, I get rid of it. Or if this condition passes, I get rid of it. OK. And this one says that stage is equal to that English character discrepancy. Or that stage is equal to this English thing called not available. Or stage is equal to this strange stra uh, stage x. So if any of these conditions is true, then I don't take it. I not it. So if I keep any row, it's not one of these four conditions. 
And when I do that, and it gets assigned to this tibble TNM, I can see that I've reduced my data set a little bit more down to 1,078. Before it was, um, what was it, 1,102. So there really was only like 24 samples that fit into these weird categories. But that's a, a small example of how you would use logical expressions like not and or to remove um, samples that you don't want. Okay, so um, sometimes we don't want to get rid of the observations, but we just want to arrange them in a more informative manner. So for example, um, uh, maybe we would like to uh, highlight that tumor stage instead of being buried way down the list. And so by, by using the arrange uh, function, I can do that. So here's my arrange. I'm going to apply it to my previous variable. And now I define what I want to sort on. So here I'm going to first uh, arrange, or not sorry, not sort, but arrange. I want to arrange on uh, the uh, tumor stage and then um, death days two. So this is the number of days to death post-diagnosis for those that um, died. And so now when I, I, I that it's, that's going to be assigned to a variable called sorted um, TNM tumor bracket, a tibble. And um, when I look at that tibble, um, I can see something like this, where I have now stage one, um, which see I've asked that it's sorted or arranged by stage. So stage one is, is the first stage. The vital status is alive. Um, but since they're alive, there's no um, number of days to death. Now, the one small thing here, actually two things, is that when I was trying to print out my my uh, tibble, I used this function head, and that just gives me the first few entries of the tibble instead of like printing out hundreds of different things. So, and here, um, you'll get used to this notation here. I'm not going to go into detail. Is that I've just asked for only three um, variables. To print out i don't want all 79 variables just those three and this is the what's called the combined operator it's a function or combined function it, it basically just makes a small little vector of those things that i want and you can see here in my example i got exactly just those three variables back okay um but when I look at the tail of that list, so if head takes the beginning, tail takes the end, same thing, I see something weird, right? Because I asked to arrange first on stage and then on death days two, the call, right? I first, I first sorted or, or arranged on pathological stage. So here, stage one is before stage two. And then on the second thing, so for all the stage one, I, I sort on the, num, uh, on the number of days till their death. So I can't tell it here because they're all equal and not applicable. When I go to the tail, to the end of the tibble, the very end of it, I notice that stage four, okay, that kind of makes sense that they're at the bottom. Um, their vital status is dead, all of them. But here, my ordering doesn't seem right. I have 1365, 255, 362, 3941, etc. I would have expected 255 to be first, then 362, then 612, etc. So, so what happened here? So I would recommend you actually pause the video for a minute and, and ask yourself, what's going on and see if you can resolve this. Okay, so the, the hint is what is the type of death days two? It's a character. It's not a number, right? It's not a double or an integer. It's a character. And so um, it has sorted these, but it sorted these values lexicographically, okay? It's sort of them in a different way than what we might expect if they had been treated as numbers. 
Now remember these quotes means it's a character. And the character A, if your last name starts with A, it's before somebody whose last name starts with AB. Sorry, if your last name is just A, it's before AB, which is before B, which is before C, etc. In the same way, the character 1 is before the character 1, 2. Okay, just like A is before AB, and character 1, 2 is before character 2. But we know that 1 is less than 2 is less than 12. Okay, so how might we fix this? Well, what we can do is use um, a function called as numeric. Now here, recall, uh, here I'm asking, oops, sorry, not there. I have my function as numeric. Now, it has one argument here called, it's going to take sorted, um, my sorted to, uh, tibble, okay, the same guy that was up here, dollar sign, death days two. So I'm just asking for the column that's that long vector of characters, this guy here, okay, that's about a thousand um, samples long. And it converts them from character into numbers as numerics. And now I'll assign that back to the same column, death days two. So I've written over the old character vector of that long column of characters and made it a long column of numerics. Okay, so what happens now? Now I can see that when I ask for the tail of my tibble, I can see that death days two is a double, but it's still not sorted, right? It's still not sorted. I have to rearrange, I have to recall my arrange function to have that done, but we're on the right track. Now, when I call a range on my new sorted that has that column, death days two as a double, now I see that when I look at the end of this list or near the end of the list, I see that, for example, stage three C and then stage four, that's the transition from three to four. Um, this person's alive, so that's NA. They're all dead, and you can see that it's probably, it, it's, it's correctly sorted by the numeric values now, because now this is actually treated as a number. Now, one little small note here is that um, you'll see that I used, again, this combine operator to just select these three variables, stage, vital status, and death days two. Now, before this comma, I said I have this range of numbers, which we saw last class. And this is saying, just print out uh, samples uh, 1,058 to 1,068. That's these guys here. It's just a way of indexing into the tibble in a nice way and printing it out. Instead of trying to list all you know, 1,000 uh, patients, right? it would just be a mess on the screen. It's just a way of uh, indexing it. I recommend that you play with some of these things on your own time in RStudio, and the assignment is going to give you lots of opportunities to practice. Um, uh, but, well, you might ask, um, AGC pathologic tumor stage is also a type character, right? So if we come back here, you can see it's also, why did it work? Uh, and I think the answer is dumb luck because actually the lexical graphical ordering of stage one, one A, one B, um, all the way to stage um, four, uh, actually um, follows what we wanted. So I guess we had a bit of dumb luck there. Okay, so what about um, now? Uh, when you want to not select rows, but columns instead. So you don't want every variable that you have in your study. Because we have a lot. We have 79 variables, remember? We have 79 variables here. And some of them are really pesky, right? Like all this barcode and BCR patient, UUID. I mean, who cares? I mean, that's that's just um, counting, right? Okay, so um, sometimes, you know, in that wrangling process of getting it into your tibble, some variables aren't that important to you. And I have to say that I probably cut it down from something like 500 variables to 79 that look kind of interesting off the top of my head. 
So the select function is what we can use to pick columns. Now, let's give you some examples. So here, I use the select on final bracket. Okay, here I choose participant, birthdays to, and menopause status. And I think I have some more here. Whoops, turn off my pencil. I ask for race and ethnicity. And now of the 79 variables, now I have a new tibble that's assigned to mini BRCA. And you can see here the tibble has only five columns, no longer 79. And those columns are exactly the ones that we asked for. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward, I think, right? Um, you can do some fancy things to select a bit easier. Like, for example, we knew in the full data set that the first gene was aniline, A N L, and the last gene is TM EM 45B. And so in the select function on final bracket, I, I can ask for the participant, but instead of writing out all those 50 gene names, I can just use the colon operator. And the colon operator gives me all 50 from an, starting at aniline all the way down to TM EM 45B, okay? So it selects all variables, X and Y inclusive. It's just a time-saving device. And here, I've saved it back to something called mini bracket again. OK, sometimes it's actually easier to list those columns you don't want. Uh, if we have 79 columns and we just want to get rid of uh, a few, um, we can list them here and then have them remove the not or the sorry the minus operator which is like a not operator not to confuse you but so basically this is still my select function on my original tibble and here i've said i don't want id tss and anything from barcode to birthdays to in my tibble and the minus operator keeps everything but those guys it's just a syntactic sugar it makes your life a bit easier and sometimes we don't even really want to remove variables but we just want to bring certain variables to the front so we can see them a bit easier um, that's nice because you know we know we have all these barcode originally all these barcodes and tss are at the beginning of our tibble and you know what, what we might want to see easier is the stage or the vital status just to kind of zero one in on it quicker now the way you can do that is again, we use the select function on our tibble, and we're going to assign the result to something called highlight, whatever. It's just a uh, arbitrary name. Now, what I've done here is I've basically just specified I want participant first, the stage variable second, okay, that's this guy, then vital status, and then death days two, right? And then, okay, everything else can just be the way it is. And so this everything function, it's kind of weird. Like it, it basically, it's in um, dplyr has this so that it just says you say, it just saves you writing out everybody because you don't care about the order of the rest of them. You just say, hey, whatever's remaining, just put it at the end, tack it on to the end, right? So again, it just saves you a few keystrokes in large, when you're dealing with large tables like this. Um, Sometimes this is a very important uh, function called rename. And I'm going to show you a really important. You'll see why it's so important right now. When I wrangled this data in from um, TCGA, the official name of this variable was called AGCC, pathological tumor stage. It's really awkward, right? It takes a lot of typing, et cetera. I just want to rename it stage from here on in for our data set. And so to do that, I use the rename function. And I'll do this on my last tibble I just created, highlight bracket. I'll assign the result to a new tibble called simple bracket, whatever. And here I've simply said stage is equal to, and this is the old name. Now you can see when I print out the tibble, uh, again, using this odor of parentheses, it just tells R to display the results of the computation. I can see that stage this AJCC thing has disappeared, and now it's just called stage. So it makes it a little bit easier to read what you're looking at. OK, so then uh, these, these next things are a little bit more complicated, um, but they're super powerful 
uh, because they allow you to chop up your data into different ways or partition it, maybe a better word, and try to get to different summary statistics, we call them. So let's suppose we ask the question, for each stage of breast cancer, what is the mean number of days patients survived before passing away? So this isn't going to consider patients who, um, who are still alive. But for those who died, what's the average number of days until their death post-diagnosis? Okay, so here's the first thing, group by, okay? It's a function. And here it takes simple bracket, that's my table. Uh, and it takes stage and vital status. So here I'm telling it to regroup my patients by stage. So now you'll see that all the stage ones are together. All the stage twos will be together. Every different value of the stage variable will be grouped together. And then within stage, I'll group by vital status. Now you see here in stage one, these patients have died. But these patients here, at least these ones, there might be more if we were to scroll down, these ones are still alive. But first, all the stage ones have been grouped together and then dead and alive. You know, if you're familiar with Excel spreadsheets, you know there's a way to, to sort on the first column and then the second column, third column, etc. This is basically the same thing. Now here, once again, I use the print just to display my resultant tibble that was assigned to this reorder VRCA. And here I'm just looking at the, the rows from 8 to 30 and columns 1 to 4. The rest of the columns are still there. I just don't care about them, so I, I just write columns 1 to 4. You'll notice here that the first, before this comma, is always the rows you want, and after is always the columns that you want. You'll get the hang of it over time. So why do you want to group? Okay, so we can ask the question um, again about, you know, what is the average number of uh, length of survival um, before death? So here, uh, what I can do is um, I can um, take my reordered BRCA, that's the result of the group by, okay? Now I'll use the summarize function. So summarize takes my, my reordered, my grouped BRCA by by stage and um, vital status. And now it computes three things. First, it's going to create a new variable called mean survive. That's what we're interested in. And within that stage, it's going to compute um, the mean of all the deaths phase two. So for all patients in that stage, it's going to compute the average of the um, uh, number of days. and um, the uh, it'll, the second thing it'll compute is the standard deviation. So we don't need to worry about too much what standard deviation is, but if you normally when you compute the mean, you're also going to compute how much variance or deviation there is around that mean. That's a standard statistical thing. Don't worry about it. And this function is interesting though. It's called a count function. So that tells me how many patients were in that stage and vital status. Okay, it's easier to see the result of it just to summarize here, the answer is put into a table called answer, and I'm going to print it out. And when I print it out, I see here that I have um, my stage. Okay, so here you see it's broken down so beautifully. Stage one alive and there's stage one dead. That's the two possibilities. In stage one alive, um, there was 78 patients. Um, they uh, are all alive, so there is no uh, mean survival time. They're still alive. It doesn't make sense. They didn't die. In stage one, uh, dead, there was 11 patients, and their mean survival was 2,054 days. Then if we go down here uh, to stage 1A, their mean survival is 992. It's quite a difference. It's quite a much shorter. But then 2A is 1,672. 2B is 1,900. And um, stage three, 13, 7, 7, 9, 4, 7, 2. That's pretty low. It's the lowest number we've seen so far. But um, at stage four, it's a thousand days. Um, so I think maybe as you maybe you can pause the lecture right now and look through that and and ask yourself, is that what you expected to see? Um, 
to me, this makes sense, very high at stage one, because it's not a very progressed disease. And it's about half that at stage four. Some of these values in between, in, in intermediate are um, a bit strange, maybe, perhaps. I'll give you um, something to think about. You should look at the N. Does that affect these numbers? Okay, and the standard deviation, uh, not, you know, here, for example. Does that help to explain um, any kind of deviations from what you'd expect in your in your answer? Uh, sometimes you, you know it's 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 uh, handy to be able to add a new variable um, that's a function of existing columns or variables. So, for example, they have this weird death days too in our data set, right? It's the number of days to death. So why I guess you could ask why do they calculate it that way? Um, I'm not sure how else to do it, except say you're 5.2 years from death between diagnosis. But um, uh, I guess just keeping that number of days is a simpler way to do it. Now we could ask, you know, essentially ignoring some leap years, we could estimate the death years as being equal to the number of death days divided by 365, right? So the mutate function, it works on, let's say our, our, our um, our uh, tibble, whatever tibble we want to give it, and now it adds a new column called death years, and um, divides it by three. It computes that column as 365 days. I'm sorry, 360. The number of death days that's observed in the, this column here, divided by 365, and that gives you your death years. So. 577 days is 1.5 years. Now here I've used select to simply um, reorder my uh, my um, tibble um, in a way that I can see the result of um, the computations. So here I've used a print on augmented brackets, another way to view your data. There's many ways to do almost anything in a programming language, just like there's many ways to express yourself in a natural language. So here I've used print augmented BRCA, but so that we can see a little bit more, I asked for 15 rows and I can do that by specifying a second parameter or passing 15 as a second parameter to this N argument. And that controls how much you get printed out. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's kind of move towards completing the transform visualized model. Um, this data science cycle. Uh, so let's try to look at this, the um, survival times a little bit. So let's try to make sense of it. So we've been using all of these um, fancy dplyr functions and let's do something kind of hardcore here. And you're gonna understand this in a few minutes, even though it's, a little, it's probably looks like gibberish right now. So I'll start off and I'll say, my small bracket is uh, basically here, what I started with, what I loaded fresh from file. And I'll rename my stage to be um, that AG, AGCC, that long thing. I'll just rename it as um, stage. So you know what? We've done that before. That's going to be a new tibble called B0. And I'm going to pass that B0 into this filter. And that filter is going to remove all the um, stages that I don't want. And it's going to remove any tumor, any, any samples that weren't tumor, all the normals. Now, your, your challenge is that you go home tonight and, well, I guess you are home right now. Um, you might want to stop the lecture right now and uh, look at how I phrased it here. It's not the way I did it earlier in the lecture, but it works. It's just a different way of doing it. And you can learn something about the Greppel function, which is really handy at times. I'll leave it there. But it's the same thing as I did before. I got rid of all those weird stages and I got rid of the normal samples here. And I'm using the AND operator there. Now that was saved to tibble B1, which is passed into a select here. And that select just chooses participant stage, vital status, status and death today. It's just those four uh, variables, okay? Easy peasy. That B1 is saved to B2 after selection which is passed into a filter. And this basically now selects only those samples of people who have died and it's saved to B3, okay? 
So there's nothing fancy there. You know the filter. That then, finally, is passed into a mutate function that computes this death years as death days 2 divided by 365. Now see, remember before, I had previously transformed my variable death days 2 into a numeric. But I haven't done that because I started way back with small bracket, the original tibble. So I, here I, I, I changed it on the fly, in a sense, to numeric, and then I divided by 365. You might stop the lecture right now in front of our studio and try and do this without um, using this function and see what happens. Finally, B4 is passed to ggplot as the data, and now I create a scatter plot that's genome point. My x-axis is going to be a reordering of the participant death years. Now, I'm not going to go into that too much here, um, but basically it's to make it look a bit prettier. What I would re recommend, and it's going to be part of the assignment, I believe, is that you try this without using this reorder to see what happens. Now, that's the participant, okay, on the x-axis. Um, this reorder changes the order of the participants so that um, they're in ascending order by how long they survived. The y-axis is how long they survived. And I've added here color to be the stage of their tumor. Okay, now the rest of this here, you can look closer on your own time, but I'm just adding, I'm making the plot look nice by adding labels and changing the font size. And here you can see that I've done something called a coordinate flip, which I'll show you in a second what that does, and facet wrap. And the facets are going to be by stage. Now we saw that an example of facet wrap uh, two lectures ago. Okay, that looks really complicated. So what does that give us? That gives us a plot like this. The time to death along this axis. Now, at, at home or on your machine, you can make enlarge this figure and you'll get rid of all these overlaps of numbers. And patients are along this axis. And you can see that um, different page, uh, different um, each patient, depending on their stage, has survived to a different length of time. So this patient here survived to, uh, I, well, you have to look, I can't see this here because um, it's compressed in, but you can see that some patients uh, died quite early and other patients survived quite longer. And this is stage one and this is stage four. And I think you can see a bit of a trend, maybe, or you disagree, I'm not sure, that the times to death, the survival times are shorter in later stages, which is maybe what we expect, okay? Now, there are ways to make these fonts a bit nicer, um, and I, I'll show you some examples of that later on, but I think that you get the idea here, more or less, and that's a pre pretty nice figure that's already telling something about the relationship between stage and survival. Okay, um, the other thing we could do is we could ask, um, if we take B5, uh, just to recall here, um, B4 was passed, this is the last one here, it's passed to the ggplot. I can create one more called B5. And here I group by uh, stage. Okay, and then I'm just gonna ask within each stage, stage one, one A, two A, et cetera, et cetera, calculate the number of uh, individuals in that class there's 11 uh, patients stage one, 24 stage 2a. And compute the mean death years, which is the mean function that just computes the mean over all the patients within each stage. So across the 11 patients that are stage one, their mean death years was 5.63. But those that are later stage, like stage four, their mean is 2.93. I would think that's pretty significantly lower so five and a half years versus uh, three years. That's how much longer that they'll likely to survive. So that, that kind of makes sense. If I wanted to, I can add that intercepts, the blue for, um, I use something called it. Um, well, I see here's the blue line and the red line. I've just superimposed those means for stage one and the last guy, which is stage um, uh, four. So if you count down here, there's nine different um, levels. 
And so I've just taken the, um, the mean death years summary uh, for the stage one and the mean death years for stage four. And I can get on there some nice plots, um, basically just to center things to show that um, the um, uh, stage one, the red guy is quite a bit, I mean, it's halfway by definition in stage one, but um, most patients in stage four have died before they reach the mean of stage one. Okay, and I, I'll leave it to you to interpret the blue curve, which represents very high stage individuals. Not a perfect figure, but, and we're going to come back to some nicer ways to represent survival data, but it's not bad for an afternoon's work. Okay, so here's a challenge for you. Note that um, the last 50 variables in small BRCA table are um, the expression values for 50 genes. Okay. When I was wrangling the data from TCGA into a table, I just used the gene name. So as we know, ANIN, FLOXC1, et cetera. I probably would have been start, have, smart to have called it gene.ANIN, gene.FLOXC1, et cetera. Probably not why, clear why that would be have been a smart thing for me to do. Uh, at this point, but um, suffice it to say here is that um, the other 29 variables, because I think there's 79 total, it would be nice to have an easy way to um, select those variables, those columns that represent gene expression from the other nine variables, which represents clinical pathological data. And right now, because um, gene names are all over the place, it's not that easy to actually select out those that are um, genes or not. Now, the fact that they are the last 50 in the table, that makes it kind of manageable right now. But if I was to add more, um, you know, if I was to use the mutate function, for example, and add more variables to the sort of to the right side of the table, it might get difficult over time to recuperate those variables that correspond to genes and from those guys that are others. Well, anyway, um, your challenge as a fun little thing is to um, uh, um, create a tibble um, called pure expression that contains only the participant variables and the expression, uh, sorry, variable and the expression of all 50 genes after changing the gene name as discussed above. Okay, so you're just going to create a table, uh, sorry, a tibble that basically has the first guy as participant and then your 50 genes, okay? So the first guy is Anin, and your last guy is this, oh, I can't write up this thing, sorry. Anin, and the last guy is TMEM, right? Dot, 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 dot. But now they're gonna be called gene dot, right? Anin, gene dot, um, TMEM. I should have added here that it's that there's in the select function and the chapter um, uh, seven in the textbook covers this. There's a nice thing called starts with, and I could have selected then uh, said I could have said um, select from my tibble starts with gene, and it would only pull back those variables, those columns, the 50 of them that correspond to genes after you've modified it this way. Okay, so yeah. I'll leave this to you to read, um, the points of reflection. Um, I think probably you have questions like, well, why not just use spreadsheets? So it's, I think, maybe interesting for you to start asking what can and can't be done easily in spreadsheets um, in terms of like what selection, et cetera. Um, of course, the challenge today too was to relate this back to Simpson's paradox. So I'd like you to think about that a little bit. Um, that should be in the slides above. We focused on removing observations to reduce heterogeneity, and there's some value in that. But what are the potential downsides of, of reducing the number of observations? I want you to think about that, okay? Um, we can talk about that in the lecture. Um, and although data science speak about transform visualized model, um, what similarities and differences do you see in this data science cycle and what you experience as a bench scientist? Are there things that are very similar to that 
transform visualized model cycle? Are there analogs? Are there some things that are just not analogous? Um, so try to point some of those things out um, in both directions. Okay, so I thank you very much and I will see you at the lecture.